we have just watched is not a reenactment of a particular accident. It is not a worst case scenario dreamed up by somebody's flight training department. It is an illustration of the kind of accident or incident that can result from one or more deviations during an approach and landing. Accidents and incidents that are being made all over the world almost every day. Threats not addressed or errors not caught have become a leading cause of aircraft accidents. The good news is these deviations are preventable. Boeing and Embraer have undertaken a collaborative effort to help prevent accidents like the one we just watched. The key to prevention is understanding and awareness. And that is the objective of this video. Understanding the mistakes that can be made, understanding the factors that can cause them to be made, and being aware of the means of preventing these mistakes is the key to not making them. Still a little fast. Coming down. Yeah. The event itself is known as a runway excursion. Check speed brake. Going off the end speed of the runway up. is called an overrun. Oh, 3,000. Reverse. Reverse. Going off the Race. side is called a veer off. Runway excursions typically occur as a result of some combination of the following factors. Flying an unstable approach, landing too far down the runway, landing on a wet or slippery runway surface, and the inadequate use of deceleration devices. The speed brakes, the wheel brakes, and the thrust reversers. Simply flying a stable approach may not be enough to prevent a runway excursion. A perfect touchdown may not be enough to prevent a runaway excursion. Flight crews need to understand all the potential contributors to a runway excursion. Even more important, they need to realize that an excursion can happen to anyone. Experienced high-time pilots, as well as relative newcomers to the flight deck. Every landing is made up of three segments. First is the approach. This is followed by the flare. And finally, after touchdown, there is the rollout. What do we mean by a stable approach? In general terms, a stable approach means we are following the correct flight path, the flight path with only small corrections needed to maintain the correct descent angle and speed. An approach that's too steep can build up speed, speed that has to be bled off Landing. before the touchdown. This can cause us to overshoot the touchdown zone. And if an overshoot is combined with a slippery runway or the late deployment of the speed brakes or thrust reversers, or worse, no deployment of these devices, no speed brake, there may simply not be enough runway left to get the plane stopped. Some approaches do not fall under the definition of stable. However, these approaches, by their very nature, demand a special briefing prior to the approach and require so much attention on the part of the flight crews that runway excursions almost never occur. Where problems occur is when a landing seems at the outset to be routine, but conditions soon show it to be anything but routine. A tailwind, predicted or unexpected, and its effect on ground speed can cause a crew to fly a too steep approach. Getting a little fast. 1,000. Yeah, I got it, I got it. This in turn can result in the plane going too fast as it approaches the runway. Generally speaking, a 10-knot tailwind, for example, can increase the landing distance by 20%. So try to avoid tailwind landings altogether by requesting a more suitable runway if one is available. An accident is almost always the result of a chain of events rather than a single event. Schedule pressures, traffic distractions, efforts to comply with controller instructions, turbulence, poor visibility, the cumulative effect of some or all of these can result in a long landing or a high touchdown speed or both. And if on top of this we add in a short runway or a sloped runway or a runway with a slippery surface, then a slightly long landing or a slightly fast touchdown can quickly deteriorate into a runway excursion. Bounces, usually a combination of an unstable approach or poor flare and thrust coordination, can also extend the landing distance. Just a 5% increase in landing speed can increase the landing distance by 10%. 10. Speed break up. After touchdown, the plane enters the rollout segment of the landing. And perhaps more than in any other segment, deviations made here 
can really increase the risk of a runway excursion because this is where the proper and timely use of the plane's deceleration devices becomes critical. Delay in their deployment or using them for too short a time can cause an otherwise normal approach flare and touchdown to degenerate into a runway excursion. Every airplane type is certified for a landing distance. A landing distance has two components. Air distance, which is the distance from crossing the threshold at 50 feet to touchdown, and braking distance, which is the distance from touchdown to a full stop on a dry runway using maximum braking and no reverse thrust. But when calculating a plane's dispatch landing distance, there's no way to take into account every airport's approach speed requirements, actual temperatures, runway friction at a given time, runway slope, and the strength and direction of local winds. For example, a wet runway surface that is normally considered to have good braking action may become treacherously slippery with just a small change in temperature. Despite advancements in sensor and communications technology, it can still be difficult for a flight crew to know exactly what the runway conditions are until they're on it. A runway surface reported earlier as good can degenerate quickly to poor. This is why it is so important that you do everything you can to heighten your situational awareness and control the factors you can control to prevent a runway excursion. These include speed, touchdown point, the timely application of appropriate deceleration devices, and the decision to break off the landing and go around or divert to another airport. Policies and procedures don't necessarily take into account the variables you might encounter. Use judgment and planning and most important, be ready for the unexpected. Touchdown zone is an often misunderstood term. Simply planning to touch down in the zone is not a guarantee against a runway excursion. Runway length, slope, surface conditions, or the wind can make it possible to touch down within the zone, but still roll off the end of the runway. Where a crew touches down must be determined by the conditions that exist at the time. After calculating the landing distance, do not rely on a random touchdown point. Instead, create one for yourself by adjusting where in the zone you need to touch down in order to come to a stop on the runway. Speed breaks up. The proper use of the available deceleration devices is crucial in order to avoid a runway excursion. The speed brakes not only increase drag, but they help put the full weight of the plane on the wheels which increases the effectiveness of the brakes. Thrust reversers are an effective way to decelerate, particularly on wet or slippery runways. But none of these devices can help if they aren't used to their full potential. Deploying them late, using only partial power, or stowing or releasing them early can greatly reduce their effectiveness. There is an aspect of thrust reversers that is very important to understand. A turbofan engine requires time to spool up and generate thrust. How much time depends on how much the engine has spooled down. At the end of an approach, your engines will most likely be at flight idle. If you do nothing, they will automatically reduce to ground idle within two to four seconds after touchdown. For example, if a 737's thrust reversers are deployed within two seconds after touchdown, the engines will still be at flight idle, so they will require only two to four seconds to spool up. This means that six or seven seconds after touchdown, you will have maximum reverse thrust working for you. Engines installed on other types of aircraft could require up to eight seconds to develop maximum reverse thrust right after touchdown. If you delay the deployment of the thrust reversers, let's say by just six seconds, the engines will have spooled down to ground idle. So now it will take them 11 seconds to spool back up, which means you won't have maximum reverse thrust working for you until at least 17 seconds after touchdown. 17 seconds. <laughs> Count it off sometime. Combine that with a long landing, too high a speed, a short runway, a poor braking surface, and that initial delay in reverser deployment can turn into a runway excursion because you won't have maximum reverse thrust when you need it the most. So, what does this mean? It means that a flight crew should deploy the thrust reversers immediately after touchdown and use all the power necessary to slow the plane to taxi speed well before the runway begins to run out. 
Tailor reverse thrust use to the actual conditions. Don't just do what's become habit. Dry runways may let a crew safely come out of reverse thrust early, but you should never assume the same technique will work on a wet or short runway. Remember, on a degraded runway, thrust reversers are much more effective at higher speeds at slowing a landing aircraft than braking alone. Some airplanes depend more on brakes than reversers for deceleration. As with thrusters, start braking as soon as the touchdown occurs. Assess the use of auto brakes and determine the best braking method for the conditions you're facing. Brake for safety, not for comfort. There's not much point in using the brakes gently for the comfort of the passengers if the plane goes off the end of the runway. If it requires maximum braking to get the plane stopped safely, use maximum braking. But what if a flight crew realizes the conditions are such that it may be impossible to continue the approach to touchdown and come to a safe stop? What then? If there is any doubt, go around. Go-arounds and diversions are safety procedures every bit as important as flying a stable approach and using all of the plane's deceleration devices effectively. Remember to brief the go-around prior to descent. It's not something to start trying to plan for when there are only seconds left in the approach. Many airplanes are committed to a landing once touchdown has occurred and when reversers have been activated. So it's important to remember that a go-around can be initiated at any time up to the point where the thrust reversers have been activated. So far it all seems so simple, right? Fly a stable approach. Flare to land on the touchdown point you have determined will give you plenty of distance to get the plane stopped safely. Don't delay the deployment of speed brakes and start braking according to the distance available and the runway conditions. Start braking as soon as the main gear has touched down and brake for safety, not for passenger comfort. Deploy the thrust reversers if your aircraft has them and use as much reverse thrust as you need for as long as you need it. Look at a little long, a little high. Going long, toga, go around, flaps 15. Flaps 15. And if the weather or runway conditions have gear deteriorated up, up. to the point where continuing the approach could result Down in a runway excursion, go around or divert to another airport. If it's really this simple, why do there continue to be runway excursion accidents all over the world? The big reason is pressure. Pressure to stay on schedule or make up time. Pressure to save fuel. Pressure to avoid go-arounds and diversions. Pressure to minimize engine and brake wear and maintenance. Another reason is attitude. It's easy for flight crews to be lulled into complacency by uneventful landing after uneventful landing. And most landings are uneventful, to the point where a flight crew can be unprepared when situations change. The answer to pressure is not to let it take priority over safety. The answer to attitude is to develop a routine that prepares you for every possibility. Plan and prepare, but know that you may have to adjust as you fly. You need to develop the habit of setting yourself up to deal with any issue that may arise during each and every landing, no matter how routine the landing may appear to be. There are just three steps to the routine. Plan, brief, and call out. And calculated landing distance is 7,700 feet with auto Planning too. includes calculating set. the landing okay. distance and runway. comparing it with the landing distance that's available for the runway you're planning to use. This will give you advance notice of how much deceleration effort your landing will require. If we have to go missed approach, I'll call uh, go around, hit toga. Briefing the go around is as important as briefing the approach. Be prepared to land or go around. By doing this, a go-around will simply become a procedure to execute, if necessary, rather than a decision that has to be debated and made at the last moment. The crew should acknowledge that the runway surface may prove to be other than what it's been reported to be. In some airplanes, two-thirds of the braking force available at higher speeds on a wet runway comes from the speed brakes and the thrust reversers, so you need to be prepared to deploy them fully and fast. In other planes, the brakes are the most effective deceleration device, and the crew should be prepared to use the maximum braking applicable to the runway conditions. And throughout the landing procedure, 
The crew should make the applicable callouts. Speed brakes up. Particularly the deceleration device callouts. Speed brakes. Reverse normal. Reversers if the plane has them. And brakes. Things that should be considered as the landing procedure progresses are. Are we on our expected approach path? Are we on speed? Do we have a tailwind? What are the runway conditions and the expected braking effort? Are we prepared to adjust our plan for the actual runway conditions we encounter? Are we prepared to use our deceleration devices effectively and completely? And are we prepared to initiate a go-around if we feel this is the best course of action? And as the plane crosses the threshold, ask, are we on speed? Are we on path? Will we make our planned touchdown point? Always remember, if we plan, if we communicate, and if we are prepared to adjust our plan if conditions change, every landing, routine or not, will stop safely on the runway.